So for today's presentation, actually we're not going to do much of a presentation. We're going to give you our 40,000 foot view of what's going on statistically in the church. But then, and this is why you need to listen, we are going to make you do some work. And so we're going to have you discuss what these findings look like in your local context, and then after that you will have to have a discussion with us. So this is the end of the passive listening part. This is now the active participation, graded active participation, by the way. Um, and so, and you know, we have the parochial report person here, so they know how to do these things. So without any further ado, let me turn it over to my colleague and friend, the Reverend Dr. Molly James. Thank you, Molly. Good morning. It's a joy to be here with Matthew and with Megan to talk to you about what we are learning from our congregations and our clergy. So I will be talking, as Matthew noted, I'm the parochial report person. So I will be talking about the data we get from there as well as some of our participation in other congregational studies and um, briefly touch on how you can connect with your own data online. And I will just say up front, I won't spend very long on that part. And if you would like to connect more with your own data, please just reach out. I would be more than happy to connect with you on Zoom and walk you through that. Right. So, I know I'm in a room full of Episcopal Church experts and that lots of the information I'm going to go through today will probably be familiar to all of you. And even so, I wanted us to have a couple of visual reminders to frame our conversation today. So, here is the big picture. Remind ourselves about the geographic context in which we operate. We span from Taiwan in the Western Pacific to Guam, Alaska, and Hawaii, east all the way to multiple countries in Europe, including Georgia, and then throughout the Caribbean and south to Ecuador. Then, of course, the bulk of our congregations are here in the continental United States. And I think this visual is helpful because it reminds us how concentrated we are in the south and the east. And if you look at membership, not just where our congregations are, our membership is also concentrated in the south and the east. So what is this data that we have from all these congregations? And I'm sure you all are quite familiar with the parochial report, so just a quick refresher on its background. Per Canon 1.6, it is designed by the House of Deputies, State of the Church Committee, and approved by Executive Council. It's an annual insight into the life, ministry, finances, and membership of the Episcopal Church. We have been collecting it for more than 100 years. Side note for all the fellow church nerds in the room, the State of the Church's Blue Book Report to the 80th General Convention, that would be the last General Convention in 2022, contained a really fascinating report prepared by the archives about the history of the parochial report. And the original ones were like letters from the congregation to the bishop. That It makes very cool reading if you, if you love history and all that kind of church nerdy stuff. So, as Matthew said, we're going to look at the 40,000 foot view of the church. So here's the 40,000 foot view in numbers. I imagine this slide doesn't surprise you. It bears out what we hear everywhere. We are declining. We have fewer congregations, fewer people than we did. We don't exactly have fewer, less money. Now, on the one hand, we're, we are, you know, if you, those are raw numbers, so if you control for inflation, the, you know, the, the money is lower. But it, we are not losing money anywhere near at the rate we are losing people. And even if we look at operating income at a diocesan level, that and is also staying the same, <clears throat> uh, a slight, small, little, Plea, if you haven't finished your diocesan report yet, could you do so? Because we're missing some data. Thank you. 
If you need help doing that, please contact our office. We would be glad to help you because we love having complete and good data. So obviously that number for diocesan income should be higher because we don't have all the diet numbers in yet. So let's put some of these numbers in context. Let's look at the people side of things over the fast few decades, looking at baptism, marriages, and funerals in the last 42 years. Not surprisingly, those numbers are dropping quite precipitously in the last few years. Notice the contrast between, say, 2000 and 2022 in terms of baptisms and marriages especially. Right, look at that, in 1980 we did more baptisms than burials. We don't, we don't do that anymore. So, let's look at this in some historical context. Now, see that graph on the left there, that green curve, that green curve, the lower one, that's the birth rate right, the number of children women are having for the 20th century. That graph on the right, that's the membership of the Episcopal Church in the 20th century. Notice any similarities between those two shapes, right? That curve of birthright and the curve of membership are pretty much the same. So it's not surprising that we are baptizing so many fewer children than we were in the 1980s. Now I think it's worth paying attention to that other curve on the left. That's the number of births, total births per year in the United States. So the declining birth rate means that the people who are already in our pews are having fewer children than they used to. But the overall population of the United States is still increasing. The 1960 census had a population of 179 million. The 2020 census had a population of 329 million. So we have a tremendous opportunity for growth as a church. It just won't come as easily or in the same way it did in the 1950s and 60s. <clears throat> One thing is for sure that the future depends on us knowing the communities around our buildings as well as we know the members who are inside of it. And if you explore on our website, and I'd be glad to, go to help you do so, there are lots of tools for getting to know your neighborhood and the neighborhoods in your diocese. So, let's go back to those people in our pews. This is what happens when you filter our data on average Sunday attendance in our congregations. Basically, the important takeaways here are that the majority of our congregations are small, and the majority of our people are in big congregations. Note also that the majority of our financial resources are in our larger congregations. A third of our people, a quarter of our plate and pledge are found in 6% of our congregations. I think it's also important to note here that the median seating capacity of the Episcopal Church, so how many people can fit in, a, in the worshiping space of any Episcopal congregation, the median number of the, that is 165. You know what our median ASA is? 35. So that means that a vast majority of our church buildings appear to be mostly empty on a Sunday morning. There may be a vibrant congregation with plenty of resources in that building, but if the nave is less than half full, it won't appear that way when you walk in the door. So those of you who administer the parochial reports, 
will know that the 2022 report didn't just ask all the usual numbers questions. There were substantive narrative questions as well. And these are the four themes that arose out of those narratives. A full report on these themes, as well as a much more detailed than we've ever had before summary PDF of the quantitative of the numbers in the parochial report analysis. Both of those are available on the General Convention website. If you go under research and statistics and look at parochial report results, you can see lots and lots of data. Now, it's good to remind you also in terms of data, you can see lots of aggregate data on our website. But you all as diocesan administrators have access to your own data for every parish in your diocese back to 1998. So you can do your own analysis as well and I know that many of you do. And if any of you would like to do more than you currently do and you need help, please contact me. I would be glad to be in touch. So before we take a quick look at what we can do with all this information, I think it's important to look at a couple more pieces of data, particularly at your level, the level of diocese. So this is a historical overview of the founding of our diocese. Not surprisingly, we founded most of our diocese in the time of our ascendancy as a church and the westward expansion of the United States. What I think is most worth noting on this slide is that we have founded 22 dioceses since 1965. Remember that chart of the birth rate and the membership of the Episcopal Church? We reached our numerical peak in 1965. Also, just while we're on talking about uh, diocese and the diocesan level, it's worth noting how many congregations receive support from their diocese and what a variety there is in how congregations are assessed by diocese. Really quite varied. So. In case you all aren't aware of that variety, just wanted to give you uh, a little bit of information about that. And then finally looking, one last piece of history. So looking at that, that's the founding of our parishes. Perhaps not surprisingly goes along with somewhat with the founding of our diocese. And of course, that huge peak uh, there is again, we're looking at, but the biggest peak of course in, in you know, the time of westward expansion, but then the next biggest peak of course is in the eras um, of when we were at our numerical peak. Although you might be surprised to know that three and a half percent of our congregations have been founded since the year 2000. So please do note that there's lots of resources to explore further with this data, with your data, um, as well as a far more um, in-depth mapping tool that we have now available on our website in which you can look both at the demographics and census data for your diocese or for um, the neighborhood around a congregation and also um, have resources there to help, um, will help you um, look at it from an eco-justice perspective. So there are ways to connect with the history of redlining in, uh, in a community. There are ways to look at what the sea level rise predictions or the flood risks are in a given area. And um, if you would like to look more at any of those, I have some resources, so please be in touch. So finally, I just wanna Draw back. Ooh. Well, that's all right. We'll just leave it there. And then I will just offer you some concluding thoughts that don't need to be uh, on. You can just listen. <laughs> we'll give you a few, a little moment here just to listen. Um, 
So this data offers much to explore in understanding the vitality and sustainability of our congregations. How do we learn what helps our congregations thrive? How do we capitalize, literally, on the fact that our financial resources continue to hold steady despite declines in people and the challenges of COVID? There are downward trends and challenges evident in this data. The data also shows much cause for hope. Challenges of decline are not new to the Episcopal Church or Christianity. You may remember that we were not very popular in America following the American Revolution, for instance. And that explosion of membership in the 1950s and, and 60s was a result of population growth. Membership growth matched the birth rate, lest we fool ourselves that our grandparents were way better at evangelism than we are. <laughs> we have been here before, quite literally. In terms of membership, we're about the same size we were in the 1930s. So this time of decline can be an opportunity for transformation, particularly because collectively we still have tremendous resources, financial, material, and human. The challenge will be finding effective ways to deploy these resources in service of shaping the beloved community. We have a generous legacy that will help us shape a hopeful future. The data about what people are seeking in communities after the isolation and loss of COVID tells us that people are seeking what our congregations offer. Communities whose primary characteristics are hospitality and love, who seek to offer a place to help people make meaning with their lives. So for all of these reasons, we can be hopeful. Thank you. Right. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about a CPG um, and the data that it holds, which is mostly around clergy. Um, and just like the broker report has been uh, collecting data for 100 years, the recorder was actually set up when the church was founded, the, um, then became known as the Recorder of Ordinations, and as well as ecclesiastical sort of status data around clergy, we also collect from clergy themselves as the recorder uh, demographic data around race, ethnicity, gender identity, and sexual orientation. And because we're the pension fund, we're able to gain insights by combining that data with data that we collect as a benefits provider, as you all know, age, gender, compensation, employment status. So let's look at clergy demographics. Now these sort of, these numbers will become important um, in later slides, so please memorize all of them. Um, so you've got you see that, that there's roughly a 60-40 split between um, uh, by gender for priests, deacons are more predominantly female, bishops are still more predominantly male. Um, in terms of race and ethnicity, it's interesting that these are active deacons um, that we're looking at. So the deacons, in terms of active deacons, are the most diverse order. Um, but bishops are significantly more diverse in terms of race and ethnicity than priests are, which is, again, interesting. Sexual orientation, in terms of diversity, the position is really reversed. There you see the greatest diversity amongst priests. And then in terms of gender identity, which is a sort of a new question for us, um, about 98% of clergy are in the cisgender categories, about 2%. Uh, multiple genders, non-binary, and we allowed a field for self-description. So let's look at ordinations, receptions, and consecrations. So this is the uh, number of priests. Entrance can be receptions or ordinations. Um, and you can see that that has gradually declined. Retirements, on the other hand, have stayed level at about um, 400 plus. And so we've had, on average, a fairly consistent gap of around 250, sorry, 150. Um, but that, I think, has, has sort of trended upwards somewhat. 
If we look at deacons, that has stayed around 90. And then if we combine the priests and deacons, we actually see that for much of the time, if you combine those two orders together, it's sort of roughly evened out with the retirements. Um, but now, again, there's more of a sustained gap between entrance and exits. So does this really matter at some level? Well, it wouldn't as much if it weren't for the age structure of the clergy. So you can see that just over half of clergy are over 55. And our retirement age is still like 65 point something, almost 66. But roughly half of the people on the right-hand side of that graph will be gone in 10 years. And so the question then arises, is that 225 per year sufficient to replace them? Um, and so that then comes to sort of say, well, who are the people who are coming in in that 225 to replace them, or the 90? Well, as you can see, um, the majority, the, m the most likely decade for people to be born in um, was the 1980s, but we still have a lot of people born in the 70s, and we still have more people born in the 1960s than the 1990s. And again, this is just the last five years. And so the way that I like to envision um, the sort of the situation of, of where clergy are is an escalator, right? A, a working escalator, not like the one downstairs, but one that actually is moving up. And you can't stop it moving. I've discovered this with age, that you can't stop the escalator moving. And it keeps going up. And most of the people in the church are already on the top part of that escalator. And they are about to get off that escalator. But as you can see, and I was born in the 1960s, Clayton was born in the 1960s, you know, we are already... <laughs> on the top part of the escalator. Some of us closer than others. So, so what we're adding is a set of people who will soon be getting off that escalator as well. And the question then becomes, what happens if that 225 goes even lower? You know, how do we fill the needs that we have. Deacons, to some degree, do fill, as we can see, a gap. But again, the most popular, most likely decade for a deacon ordained in the last five years to have been born was the 1950s. So sort of when we look at that, it becomes a kind of a concern. Because we really relied on these late ordinations. We've relied on people born during those periods that Molly was showing us when the church was, churches were fuller, when there were lots of baptisms, when there were many people coming in, not just to our church, but churches generally. And so what you get now is a situation where you have to ask yourself, right? Will a, unlike a baby boomer, will a millennial reach 45 and say to themselves, who may well be a nun, right? You all know about the nuns from the Pew studies. Will that person suddenly wake up one day and say, you know what, I think I want to get ordained to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church. Because that's the model essentially that we're relying on. But that was a reservoir that was long ago, that is now in many ways fully depleted. So there are some questions that you, I would like you to answer about where do you see your next generation of clergy coming from? So, let's look at ordinations and receptions. We can see, remember that you've memorized all the initial figures, right? So, you can see that we have slightly higher proportion of females getting ordained, so there's a slow movement towards gender equality amongst priests. Um, deacons still more likely to be female. Um, and bishops gradually moving towards um, uh, more even in terms of gender. Um, now, one of the things that I think is also interesting, too, is that there's a fractional difference in terms of um, clergy of color. Remember, it was 13%, roughly sort of 12, 13% 
clergy of color amongst priests, ordinations of 14%. That's going to be a very slow transition unless something changes. And I think that that is, um, those are roughly even in terms of orders. Um, in terms of ordinations and receptions, things actually for sexual orientation look roughly the same slightly higher proportion in terms of diversity for the priesthood than we have now, but not a massive change in, in, in that. Um, but here is a change. So from the time Barbara Harris was consecrated through um, 2015, only 9% of bishops who were ordained were female. And then in the next six years, 43% of the bishops consecrated were female. So change can happen actually quite radically and suddenly in our church if the spirit moves us. So let's look quickly at deployment. Um, you know this slide, right? My um, emerging model versus, well, now emerging models. So somebody said there is really no single emerging model. It's emerging models um, versus the, tra the traditional model that we all know about. What does that look like? It is, remember you've memorized your statistics, right? So um, it is more likely um, on the whole to be, um, males are more likely to be full-time, as you can see, um, compared to females. Uh, clergy of color, again, which were around 13%, are more likely to be part-time. Um, and with LGBTQ plus clergy, it is slightly more likely that, that they're going to be part-time. So you can see that there is some race, gender, sexual orientation differences in that model of deployment. Now let's go to the traditional model, senior rector, okay? That means there are two priests in the parish, right? Or two clergy in the parish, two paid clergy for us in the parish. Um, and the rector being this we call the senior rector. Again, remember that 60-40 divide, more likely to be male. Remember that roughly 87-13 divide in terms of race and ethnicity, more likely to be white. And again, remember that 24%, 76% divide, more likely to be heterosexual. So the traditional demographic is more likely to be there for the senior rectors who are in our larger churches. Um, but what we find when we go to another, and I would still call it traditional model because we're still looking at full-time people, but we're looking at people who work in the diocese, work in schools, work outside the parish, more evenly male-female, um, more likely to be clergy of color, um, roughly even in terms of sexual orientation. What does that mean, though? That has actually some quite big orient uh, uh, some quite big sort of implications for the church. Um, the Episcopal clergy are becoming more diverse, but very gradually. And there is somewhat of a question that if, and I don't know, Megan knows better than I do. It may be deployment uh, committees. It might be um, whatever ways that clergy are selected for those big parishes, it tends to be in that traditional demographic. And as a result of that, if that's where the bulk of our people are, right, that means that younger people looking up, if they're female, if they're um, congregants of color, don't pe see people in those big pulpits who look like them. And that might be something that needs to be looked at if we want to move that figure of 14% up to something that really starts to change the church. We have seen significant changes, and we saw it in the House of Bishops over the last five years, so we know the church can change. Um, I pointed to what might be a shortage of clergy, but it could be situational. And you're going to tell us exactly what's happening in your diocese when we come back. And what we do see too is that clergy of color, um, female clergy, LGBTQ plus clergy are finding more opportunities outside the parish than in those larger parishes. And I think that that's important for us to think about. 
So let me now introduce Megan Froelich, who knows everything that goes on in these. I just guess about these deployment things. Megan knows it all. So here's Megan. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Molly. I'm Megan Froelich, and I serve on the presiding bishop's staff in the Office for Transition Ministry. I want to thank you for your intentions and prayers for our presiding bishop. If you haven't heard, he is out of ICU from his surgery. He is chatting. He's in a normal room. And again, thank you so much for your kind concern for him. It is always a pleasure to work with my wonderful colleagues and friends, Molly and Matthew. And where else do you find the presiding bishop's staff, the general convention office, and CPG having such a good time together? So <laughs> well, I really enjoy the work that we do together. My time for you, we've saved the tiniest um, presentation for the very last of the three of us. I'll only be about seven minutes and plenty of time for your discussion and your questions. Molly and Matthew have the pleasure of a great span of time and historical trends. My time with you today is about a snapshot. It's about a postcard of a time of spring of 2023. So a little bit about our office. Um, we're going to talk just a tiny bit about my department, how regional transition groups are organized, a uh, little bit about data, which hopefully will show you um, where we are in this past spring, and then some contextual factors that um, Matthew alluded to about what is happening in search and call processes, and then it will be your time for discussions and questions. Our office is staffed by two people to support the entire church. And we provide support to bishops, diocesan staff, clergy, seminaries, other groups. We work with the Lutherans and others, and then also our Anglican Communion partners. My wonderful colleague, Sabrina Neely, sends her regards to you also. Some of you may have spoken with her. Um, we also help orient some new transition ministers, and those are the folks in your teams, on your diocesan staff, um, that uh, work with your parishes individually as well as with each diocese. There are four self-organized groups, province eight uh, in the western-ish uh, regions of the country, provinces five, six, seven in the middle meet together, and uh, TMC is kind of the northeast, and province four kind of the southeast, and there's a little bit of overlap in that. Province nine handles, tra handles transition a little bit differently, and so they are not, they have chosen not to be part of these um, self-organized groups at this time. Each group meets twice yearly, and we talk about um, shop and swap. It is our goal in transition to find the right fit for each parish and each clergy person. And that goal is shared across the church. It's not a matter of, oh, I'm going to go steal your person, although that might be a temptation from which we repent often in transition. But we really are a team across the whole church and, um, and really worked with the work of the Holy Spirit to try to find the best fit for each parish and each clergy person. A quick refresher about where we are in our geography and our distribution. As Molly mentioned, our number of parishes as well as our membership are distributed differently ge geographically, and the southeast and the north and um, have more people and more parishes at this time. The next slide that we're going to look at um, just refreshes you. You know where you are on that map by, by province. and. Um, for this snapshot that we'll look at for this past spring, and they, the regional groups just met, so I don't have all that data from a few weeks ago, but it's very similar, the groups I do have from, um, that not everybody attended the spring meeting, so the, the level of accuracy that Molly and Matthew have, I don't have. This is self-reported from each diocese and each region, and um, those so things are a little bit different region to region. The important point is what are the trends and the ratios that you're seeing. And if you're interested in any of our slides, um, those can be made available to you uh, with by asking our wonderful conference coordinators. So if we take a look at this, the, the two levels of green show you part-time and full-time. And this will not be a surprise for you, doing all the different reports that you do. And the diocese could not function without you, by the way. So my heartfelt thanks to each of you, having served as a candidate of the ordinary myself. I know the important work that you do. And we really couldn't do it without the work that you do. When we look at parishes, 
uh, the part-time and full-time positions available in the western areas in province eight we have more full-time than part-time and in the east and south we have more part-time than full-time and while you know where you are with your diocese that may have been a trend that you didn't know for the whole church as it um, as we see it here and this is as of the spring and the fall numbers are, are actually quite similar what do we take away from this this is a change over the last 10 20 years that we've full-time parish positions are shifting to more part-time and there are lots of factors that you know well and that we will talk about in just a minute, some of those contextual factors. But as we shift from full-time to part-time, that raises a question about leadership for each of us. What does parish leadership look like? And I don't just mean ordained leadership. I'm one of those priests who really thinks that you don't need a priest to do that most of the time. Um, so raising up leadership in all its forms uh, is something that I advocate We'll move along to how many priests in the spring were presented as available and currently looking for a new position, and we'll look at that in relationship to the openings that we just saw, this little snapshot here. If we look at, uh, on the left-hand side, province eight, there were 107 openings that were um, available, presented in the spring, and 21 clergy said that they were currently in search. If we look at kind of the Northeast, that's Transition Ministry Conference, 200, almost 300 openings and 31 clergy were available in search at that time. Now, it's not that clergy are only looking in their own regions. Of course, we might have someone from the East looking in the West or across, you know, all the different things. But again, if we look at the ratios of available positions to priests who say they are currently in search, it's a big gap there. How are we gonna address that as a diocese, as a church, as a culture for the Episcopal Church. Some of the contextual factors that we keep hearing about are um, families, and especially after COVID, the priorities for people are clarified pretty often. I need to be near my aging parents. I really want my kids to be able to finish school with the people that they've only seen on screen. Um, all the different family connections and, uh, and needs in that, in that regard. Lots of financial changes as parishes have had financial needs change. You might have a rector that says, I know our finances are down. I'm actually willing to take a pay cut because this is where I really think I should be. And the, you know, do we go part-time? Do we not go part-time? How do we do that? Or I'm not actually, because of my household, able to take that dip in finances. And so where do I need to move to? And am I able to do that? Are we able to offer relocation packages to clergy that we may be calling? All of those factors uh, factor in. People are less willing uh, to move geographically these days unless it's for family or financial reasons. So kind of the, the, the days of, oh, I think I'll go serve some far-flung place um, are, less of, are less happening now. And those of you who work in transition know from your own diocese, um, how significant that is. The housing market also affects people's ability to move. Right now, you can sell your house pretty easily. What are you gonna buy? Or rent? I live in and serve from Akron, Ohio. This is not a metropolis of New York, may I tell you. We, uh, we're, the, we're the home of the music group, The Black Keys. Uh, one of their moms uh, is in my yoga class. And, uh, and if those of you who are old enough remember Devo, that's our other claim to fame musically. Um, <laughs> but our, you know, even, even in a little Akron, Ohio, on my little street with an 1,100 square foot house, the housing market has been so volatile. I've lived there 20 years now. Um, the, the housing market's been a completely up and down from the top to the bottom, and that affects priests' ability and households' ability to be able to move. We've learned a lot in COVID. Uh, we've learned a lot of what we want to do, and we've learned a lot of things we probably don't want to continue. Um, so those learnings affect how search committees 
are having their willingness to change. Matthew alluded to um, larger parishes possibly not being willing to change in who they visualize as their clergy leadership. And we know that after COVID, we've kind of taken a step back in our willingness uh, to innovate in some of the, the national trends that we see across all mainline denominations. Our political climate also affects how and where priests are going to serve. Our increasing polarization, um, I hear anecdotally and often, that priests don't want to go to a place where they're going to be attacked every single day. One of my friends in Ohio was actually punched in the face on a Sunday during the middle of COVID over masking. She, you know, she's okay, but you know, what's going on in the world? So um, the political climate um, affects how things go. And then uh, various cultural factors. Do I, as a priest, want to go serve in a place that really isn't going to be welcoming to me or my family? Is it, or perhaps even unsafe to me and my family? Um, and that affects how search and call processes go and how willing uh, priests are um, to be able to serve in a particular location. There are many more factors, of course, that are individually that are individually focused, um, and I'll end I'll end on a happier note. A lot of priests that we talk to all the time, and I only get to talk to them when they call us for help with the great big database in the sky that says, "Oh, it's like we're like the LinkedIn database." I, you know, I want to find a new call, and I'm thinking about it, and they're never happy. They're always stressed. We're like the dentist. You know, you don't you don't always want to see us, but when you need us, you need us to be really good and very kind with you. So I get a lot of pastoral co phone calls, as does Sabrina, my wonderful colleague. So we're really talking to people in. In the, in the stress points, some of the, the stress angles of their life, and we love that part of the work too. And a lot of priests are so happy still to be serving and so committed to their people where they are and committed to the hope and the possibilities of the places they will serve in the future. So that gives me incredible hope. And also, as I hear about search um, and search teams saying, we actually want a future that is open continuing to be open to what God wants for us. So I find a lot of hope in the work that I do, and I know a lot of that is facilitated by the work that you do. So thank you.